fundamental question that a practitioner needs to ask about drug therapy is whether an administered drug, given at a certain dosage and via a specific route, can reach the necessary sites in the body. Certainly, most would presume that the logic we're about to describe is built in to a regimen found in a published drug formulary or in a drug company's published information about the drug. However, there may be patient-related circumstances that influence either the practicality of such a drug regimen, for example, a mean or dangerous cat leading to difficulty giving an oral drug, or disease factors, for example, poor perfusion, abscess, etc., that hamper achievement of the necessary drug concentration to treat the disease. So let's take a look at the drug and tissue factors that impact the movement of a drug from its site of administration to the site of disease. Here we'll consider the most important factors as well as the most common tissue barriers to drug penetration. What is the simplest scenario? Drug diffusion across the cell membrane barrier. The most important factor here is the concentration gradient achieved of the fusible drug that can be presented to the cell membrane. Most drugs are small molecules, that is, less than 900 molecular weight. Of course, the drug's chemical structure also impacts whether it is lipophilic and therefore can easily pass through a lipid cell membrane or hydrophilic and less likely to do so. In a drug's charge or degree of ionization at the pH on that side of the membrane will reduce the tendency to move across the membrane unless there is a pH difference across the membrane that can lead to what we call trapping of that molecule on the other side of the membrane. Of course, the surface area and thickness of the membrane layers will either facilitate or obstruct drug passage, respectively. Not all drugs must diffuse through a lipid membrane. Aqueous pores in a cell membrane or tissue allow movement of aqueous, soluble drugs. And bulk fluid movement can drag solute molecules that are small enough through aqueous channels. However, there are also specialized proteins in cell membranes that move endogenous and exogenous compounds through tissue barriers. Organic anion and cation transporters or carriers can be tied to transmembrane ionic gradients such as sodium and hydrogen. Active transporters, meaning that they expend energy, also exist. Transport proteins are located at portals of entry for exogenous compounds. Examples include intestinal and hepatic cells. Conversely, such carrier proteins may be placed to reduce entry of xenobiotics into what we call sanctuary tissues like the brain, cerebral spinal fluid, placenta, prostate, the eyes, or testicles. So transporter carrier proteins impact all aspects of drug or toxin movement in the body, that is, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Perhaps the most important and ubiquitous of these proteins is P-glycoprotein, which is a part of a superfamily of efflux transporters. And its expression has also been associated with the development of multidrug resistance to antibiotics and cancer chemotherapy drugs. So let's take a look at some specific instances of drug absorption to help you understand these processes, starting with GI absorption. For practical reasons, oral administration is often a preferred route for many drugs. Let's trace a drug going through the GI tract until the point of its absorption. First, the drug needs to disintegrate, then dissolve, and finally be absorbed. The time frame over which this occurs is impacted by how the drug manufacturer has formulated the pill or capsule in the presence of water to allow rapid dissolution and gastric juices. For example, Extended release products are designed to prevent a rapid bolus of absorption. However, the drug release pattern is usually optimized for one species, often humans, leading to notoriously variable release patterns when applied to other species. However, as you've undoubtedly been told by your pharmacist, the rate limiting step of drug absorption is dissolution, and drugs are absorbed more rapidly and completely when given with water. Now what about the effect of food? In general, the presence of food delays and prevents complete absorption of most drugs by binding the drug, speeding the movement of ingester through the GI tract, and reducing the surface contact between the drug and epithelial absorption sites. For these reasons, you may have been told to take a drug either one hour before or two hours after a meal. 
and ruminants, this is a reason why fasting is sometimes recommended for drugs like the anthelmintic oxfenbendazole. Conversely, if a drug is very lipophilic, it may be recommended to be administered with food to engage bile acids in the rate-limiting dissolution step. Examples are the antifungal drug griserfulvin and the adrenolytic drug OP-prime DDD. Epithelial permeability can be influenced by disease, and co-administered drugs can compete for epithelial drug transporters. Efflux transport proteins and drug metabolizing enzymes are located in the GI epithelium and can block absorption of a drug or lead to its metabolism in the gut, respectively. Either way, the drug does not reach the circulation. In addition, as drugs are absorbed and passed into the hepatic portal system, the tendency of the liver to extract the drug, that is, a first pass effect, is impacted by the liver's drug transporters and enzymatic ability to metabolize that compound. In general, if over three quarters of a drug is extracted on first pass through the liver, the oral bioavailability, also called F, will be reduced dramatically. Drugs with high first pass extraction require much higher oral dosages than those given parenterally, that is IV, IM, or subcutaneously. Or they cannot be practically administered orally at all. Lidocaine is a good example of a drug that cannot be given by oral routes. Topical administration of drugs can lead to transdermal absorption. However, the healthy, non-disrupted stratum corneum is a barrier to most drugs, with the possible exception of small lipophilic compounds like fentanyl. If absorbed at all, the drugs often pass paracellularly, that is, between cells, and penetration rates are slow compared to those across other cellular membranes, particularly for water-soluble drugs. Strategies to improve absorption include adding heat or moisture by an occlusive dressing or the pharmaceutical addition of detergents or solvents that facilitate absorption. Good examples of this are seen in commercial fentanyl patches or fentanyl that's been prepared with penetration enhancing substances or in compounds like methimazole that are prepared with chloronic glycopin gels that can be administered on the penny of cats for treating hyperthyroidism. Let's now take a look at absorption through mucosa, first starting with the gingiva. Mucosal epithelium has no stratum corneum, so drugs pass more easily than through the skin. Also, when a drug is placed on the gingiva or buccal mucosa of the mouth, the absorbed drug is not subject to first pass hepatic metabolism. This comes in handy when you need to deliver an anesthetic or tranquilizer to a cat by squirting it in its hissing mouth. It should be noted that the pH of saliva in a species is a key factor impacting whether a drug is uncharged and absorbable or charged and unabsorbable. For example, buprenorphine, a weak base, tends to be absorbed gingivally in a cat with high pH saliva, but not in dogs with lower pH saliva. And what about tracheobronchial absorption? Drugs administered by aerosol lead to drug deposition on bronchiole or bronchiolar mucosal surfaces. The large surface area and high local concentrations of a lipophilic drug can result in quite rapid absorption of lipophilic drugs into the circulation. Conversely, hydrophilic or charged drugs like the anti-muscarinic drug ipotropium will have lower absorption rates from this location, thereby sustaining the desired local effects. An example of alveolar absorption is, of course, gas anesthetics that generally are small, volatile drugs with very high lipophilicity, allowing rapid diffusion through the alveoli into the bloodstream. Now let's turn to other routes of administration, subcutaneous and intramuscular. In general, both lipophilic and hydrophilic, that is, charged and neutral drugs, can pass through capillaries via fenestrations, leading to blood flow being the limiting factor for the drug absorption rate. Intramuscular injection generally leads to faster absorption of aqueous drugs, that is within minutes, compared to subcutaneous routes. But this rate may vary depending upon the drug concentration, lipid solubility, vascularity, state of vasoconstriction, volume of the injection, and the osmolality of the solution. 
large substances, that is over 20,000 molecular weight, when injected by non-IV roots, are generally taken up into the lymphatics. Let's talk about the special case of depot products. Pharmaceutical strategies for depot preparations where absorption is slowed down include the addition of less soluble esters, which must be released by tissue esterase enzymes. Classical examples of this include procaine and benzathine esters of penicillin and the acetate and other esters of steroid drugs, examples being the glucocorticoid prednisolone acetate and the mineralocorticoid hydroxycorticosterone pivolate. Furthermore, pharmaceutical companies alter the drug injection vehicle, that is, whether it be oily or aqueous, to retard or speed absorption from a site. Some tissues, such as the blood brain or cerebral spinal fluid barrier, retina, mammary glands, and testicles have tight intercellular junctions, which restrict the movement of drugs. These sanctuary tissues, as they're called, are notoriously difficult to treat because of the physical barrier or because of transporters that move drug out of the tissue. However, ways to bypass the barriers have been designed, including ion trapping of basophilic antimicrobials in the mammary gland, such as is seen with the drug penethamate. The pharmacokinetic term bioavailability is addressed elsewhere, but when generic drugs are reviewed for approval, the manufacturer must show that three behaviors of the generic drug are equivalent to that of the trade name product. One, the peak concentration, also called Cmax. Two, the time to peak concentration, called Tmax, representing the rate of absorption. And three, the amount of drug absorbed, represented by the area under the pharmacokinetic curve, also called AUC. Regardless of the route of administration or pharmaceutical preparation, once a drug reaches the systemic circulation, the drug's distribution, metabolism, and excretion will be the same. So in summary, drug molecular weight, lipophilicity or hydrophilicity, and tendency to be charged at physiological pH are important determinants of drug diffusion across membranes. Drug carriers and active transporters impact drug uptake and discharge from tissues. Oral drug absorption is impacted by local, gastric, and enteric pH. Action of epithelial anion and cation tra transporters, intestinal drug metabolism, and the presence of food and water. Drugs absorbed by the GI tract often face hepatic drug metabolism, leading to a first-pass effect. As a result, Drugs with greater than 75% extraction often cannot be practically administered orally. The non-intravenous routes of administration, such as gingival, transdermal, bronchial, subcutaneous, and intramuscular, each have advantages and disadvantages. Generic drug manufacturers in most countries must demonstrate that the drug concentration, timing of peak absorption, and percentage of absorption are indistinguishable from a brand name drug. 